How many of you have made plans and then had them not work out so well? Anybody? Yeah. I've got good news for you this morning. God made a plan and he's made it work even in the midst of people who were opposed to his plan. So there were things that didn't go well in the eyes of people, but God did not let that stop his plan from being successful. As a matter of fact, I invite you to open to the, books of, the book of Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at one simple verse. And we're seeing in Acts 2 verse 23 that in this one simple verse, God reveals his predetermined plan. And it says this, This man, Jesus, delivered up by the predetermined plan. Another word for that is predestination. And foreknowledge of God, you, sinful people, nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up. So, godless men got in the way of God's plan and God brought the ultimate victory. Sinful people crucified Jesus. God raised him from the dead. God has had a plan to bless sinners. God has had a plan to redeem them and forgive them and adopt them as his children. God's got a plan that is amazing. He wants to bless really nasty people. Is that your plan this week? That in, in, in your guts right now, you're feeling like, Man, I can't wait for Monday because I just want to go out there and bless really godless people. Is that what you're feeling? God's feeling that. And in God's guts, he made this plan between God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit before they even created the earth. Think about that. Before there was a little speck of dust flying around a little star called the sun, before the heavens were made, before the earth was created, before there was an ocean, before you or I even existed in Adam's DNA. Before any of that, God had a plan. And he determined it would work. In God's predetermined plan in Acts 2.23, we saw that Jesus was delivered into the hands of godless men. So sinners can't stop God's plan. And they put him to death by nailing him to a cross, which is the worst, worst death imaginable. And yet Jesus was raised from the dead. Success for God. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we see that God has blessed everyone in Christ. Everyone who lives by faith in Jesus, God's blessed them. And I invite you to read with me, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to the kind intention of his will. Did you note that in the very beginning of this, God says that with every spiritual blessing in heaven, he is blessing us. God's blessing is not, okay, you get one today, you get one today. Well, you weren't so good yesterday, so you don't get any today. That's not how God works. Every, every person who comes to faith to him through Jesus Christ receives every spiritual blessing. Can you wrap your brain around how many blessings that is? That's more than you've got hairs on your head. That, that's more than you've got money in the bank. That's more than the problems you've got. That's more than you can count. Every spiritual blessing. God is infinite in his love, which means his blessings are infinite. And that's what he's blessing you with in Christ. God has a plan. and His plan he created before the foundations of the world. And his plan is to bless you with every spiritual blessing 
in Christ. Now, there's something you need to understand about predestination that you can understand. Predestination is kind of a weird concept to, to try to even think about. How can somebody create something before it exists, right? How can God determine what something's going to happen like before it even exists? But God does. God predetermines. It's a mystery. And in his predestination, it is his plan and his purpose to bless you in Christ. Your blessings are in you. And they're not in this world. They're in Christ. All of them. So every spiritual blessing that Jesus has for you, every spiritual blessing God the Father has for you is in Christ. So his predetermined, predestined plan is in Christ. Aren't you glad it's not in the Federal Reserve Bank? It's in Jesus. So your predestination is in Christ. It's not in you. doesn't depend on you. doesn't depend on any person. It is in Christ. He chose us in Jesus before the creation of the earth. How many of you remember being a little kid on a playground? And, and maybe you were the youngest one there, and, and they chose up teams to play a game, and you did not get picked. Anybody remember that? Maybe you were the smallest one there, or maybe you were the slowest one there. It doesn't matter. They didn't pick you. They didn't want you. And we all know what that rejection feels like. But the Word of God says God chose you. He picked you for his team. He picked you for his family. Now, you who are parents understand that when you have babies, uh, you might choose to have a baby, but you don't get to choose the baby you get. You do understand that. But God chose you. Literally. You are not an unknown quantity to God. You were not an accident to God. He chose you. He chose you in Christ. He chose you before you were created. He chose you in all that you are, which, de which says very clearly that God wants you to be his son or daughter. He wants you. He chose you. He loves you. Nobody else on this planet might love you, depending on how you are on any particular day. You know, you ever get up on the wrong side of the bed and everybody goes, please go back to bed. But God says, I chose you. I love you. I'm going to bless you. That's God's plan. He predestined to choose you. And he not only wants to bless you with every blessing in the heavenly places, he not only wants to choose you in Jesus before he created the earth, but he is making you holy and blameless before him. Holy and blameless. Now, most of us look pretty clean right now. It looks like you washed your faces, combed your hair, brushed your teeth. Most of you, you look like that. But aren't you glad? But how many of you actually feel holy and blameless? It's amazing to me, nobody raises their hands. You know why we don't feel holy and blameless? Because we know our own junk. We know our sins, we know the stuff we've done, we know where we fall short, we know. And so there's no way we want to appear before God like Isaiah did in Isaiah chapter six when, when God brought Isaiah to heaven and Isaiah was a prophet, I mean, he was a holy man of God, right? No, what did he say when he stood before God in heaven? Woe is me. I don't belong here. I'm not holy. I'm a sinner. And God says, he's not only blessed you, he's not only chosen you, he's made you holy and blameless in Christ. So how do you wrap your brain around that when, when you don't feel it? Well, how many of you feel your DNA? Anybody? You can't possibly feel your DNA because it's below a molecular structure. It's smaller than an atom. I mean, you can't touch your DNA. You can't feel it. So here's the work that God did when he chose you in Christ, when he predestined you in Christ. God transferred you and changed you from 
the genetic family tree of Adam, that sinful jerk that he was, who rebelled against God and caused all the problems in this world by his sin. And every woman said, amen, right? You do realize God places all the blame on Adam, not Eve. Okay, just we're, we're clear on that. Okay, so God transferred us out of the genetic family tree, his DNA, or transferred out of Adam and into Christ. So whose blameless, holy DNA do you have? Christ. You are in Christ. Kind of puts a whole new spin on it, doesn't it? Is your understanding just a little clearer now of how God sees you at a molecular level? You are in Christ holy, sinless, blameless. Wouldn't you like to appear before a judge like that? You want to dance? Yeah, can't touch me. Right? I'm guiltless. Can't blame me for a thing. Can't convict me of anything. I'm perfectly innocent. Blameless. That's a good feeling. That's what God says you are. In Christ, he's predestined you to be holy, blameless. Feel better already, don't you? That's what you are. In the eyes of God. God has literally made this so in Christ. And it keeps getting better. Because in love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to his kind will. Then all the women go, hey, what about us? I'm not a son, right? Here's a reason. Here's the reason that God in his perfect wisdom in the word of God, which is without error, God says sons, not sons and daughters. It's not a sexist comment from God. He is not excluding women. In Jesus' day and Paul's day, inheritances, estates, were passed on to the son, not the daughters. You go, well, that's not right. Well, okay, that's reality, though. That's the reality. So God communicated through his word, which was written in that day between Jesus' age and Paul's age, right? In that era, God gave his word written, and they understood that inheritance went to sons. So God used the word sons. But that word sons includes every believer in Jesus, including all you women. So God's not saying, you have to become a son, cut all your hair off, start wearing jeans. No. He's saying you are receiving the inheritance. So you're in the family and you're receiving the legal inheritance that's coming through Jesus. How cool is this? That every believer, man and woman, is included in this inheritance. How many of you would like to be in the inheritance of Bill Gates' estate? Anybody? <laughs> yeah, come on, raise that hand, be honest. Okay, absolutely. Uh, Jesus is a little richer than Bill Gates. Jesus has more gold than Fort Knox. Jesus actually not only owns the planet Earth and everything in it and on it, he created it. If he ever runs short of anything he wants here, he'll just make another one. He created all that exists. So if our infinite God owns everything he created, and we can't even see the end of how many stories he's created, I don't think his love or kindness to us has a limit either, do you? And so his inheritance to us is probably bigger than you can imagine in Christ. This is what he's predestined. How good is our God? <laughs> it doesn't get any better, does it? Aren't you glad you got up for church today? Yes. Amen. Yeah, I lost an hour of sleep, but God's mercy is better. It is so good. God loves us with a love that is timeless. Before time began, before this world was created, he predestined you to receive 
his love in Christ, this brand new inheritance that's inexhaustible in Christ, and he's given all of this freely. You don't ever work for your relationship with God. It comes to you through Jesus. It is a gift. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. It is according to his kind will, not how good you are. And you all said, amen to that. So his kind will predestined you to receive all these blessings in Jesus. And the miracle of predestination results in something. When Jesus was crucified, what was the result God was going for? You know the answer begins with an R. Resurrection, yes. So God has a result in mind for all the good he's doing for you. God's plan has a purpose for you. Let's look at a couple. First, all of this is going to result in the praise of the glory of his grace. Grace is undeserved favor. So all that God's doing to predestine is going to result in the praise of his glory, not yours, his. And his grace is undeserved favor. How many of you have been in, in a, a moment recently where there was so much joy that you just couldn't stop praising, dancing for joy, jumping up and down, tears of joy rolling down your cheeks? I mean, you just were so happy. It was just kind of exploding out of you. Anybody? Yeah, it doesn't happen to us every day, does it? Last night I was watching a DVD of motorcycle racing. I was watching this DVD of motorcycle racing because my wife's on a quilting retreat. So I had the house to myself. So I exulted in my hobby of motorcycle racing. So I was watching this brand new DVD of the Isle of Man TT races, greatest race in the world, four hours of this. And I'm watching grown men achieve this victory in this race. And these men, most of these guys uh, have been racing this race for years, decades, because beginners are almost not allowed to race this race. It's so dangerous. It's uh, over 32 miles is one lap. And uh, their, their average speed, and they're on public roads in, our, in the Isle of Man, which is like Ireland, uh, tiny little roads with rock walls. So this is the most dangerous race in the world. And they've done it for more than 100 years. Great race. So now that you've got all that amazing history, I know you're just like, Steve, please stop. I'm watching grown men race this race, and one of them, obviously only one, wins, right? And as soon as they cross the finish line, they are exploding in joy and praise. They're not just giving each other high fives. I mean, these guys, they're all, you know, they've got the helmet, the leathers and all that stuff on. But they're just jumping out of their skin with happiness because it takes probably, it takes a race team of like a hundred guys who work an entire year to get to the Isle of Man for one week of races. And the race only, la it's one race, the guy races, right? So he, he does all the practice and all the prep and all that stuff. And he, he does this one race that might be four laps, 32 miles each or six laps, depending on the race. And if he wins, and there's guys that have raced this thing for more than 10, 20 years and never won. So if the guy wins, you can imagine his joy because it's taken 10 years of his life of risking everything for 10 years to achieve this one moment of victory. So you can imagine what that's like, right? These grown men who are the most macho racers in the world have tears running down their cheeks and they're slobbering all over everybody. They are just exploding in happiness and praising and glory. And it's temporary. You know what their prize is? I mean, they get a cool trophy, but they actually get the wreath of laurel leaves wrapped around their necks, you know, draped over them. And, and that's what the Greek Olympic guys used to get 2,000 years ago. You know, just some leaves that turn brown within a couple hours. Uh, victory's temporary, right? Not our victory in Jesus. The result of God's plan results in the praise of his glory and his grace forever. 
and then some more. We don't cross the finish line in only one moment where the result is completely determined on our effort. Jesus has already won the race. He's given us his victory, and his victory is forever. Let that sink in. You have no idea what's going to happen in your job tomorrow. You have no idea what's going to happen next week or the month later. You can make plans, right? We, took, we joked about this at the very beginning. We make plans, and they can go in a second. But God's predestined a purpose for you that results in the praise of his glory and his grace that is without end. It never stops. It's so good, you're never going to stop overflowing with joy. In this world, we've got some pains and problems, don't we? In this world, like in the middle of Romans chapter 8, Paul wrote, in this world we do groan. You don't groan when you're happy, do you? You groan when you're in pain. But God has given us his victory in Jesus. And we will celebrate this here and now and forever. And he's lavished this upon us. So before I even get into, you know, the next realities that he's given us in his predestination and this gift he's given us, I, wanna, I want you to understand what lavish means. Because we don't typically live in a lavish culture. We live with a lot of sinful selfishness, but we don't live with a lot of lavishness and so we have a hard time when God says he's going to lavish his love upon us. Well, what does that really mean? Okay, now if I walk up to you with a cup of water because you're thirsty, and I just dip my finger in it, and I just give you like a splash, like I hit two drops in your face, you're like, I'm, I'm thirsty, I don't want to shower. And, and even two, two little drops of water is not exactly a shower, is it? So I said, okay, fine. And then I just pour the water over your head, you're like, Steve, you're being a jerk. You know, it's not helping me, right? That's the opposite of lavishness. We all agree, right? We recognize that instantly. A little child recognizes that. But what if I turn on a fire hose when you're thirsty? Would that be lavish? No, no that's, that's even more cruel. Uh, come on, just give me a glass of water. Okay, when God gives you a glass of water and he gives you lavishly his love and grace and, and mercy, his power, all of his goodness to you, here's what God's giving you. Think Niagara Falls. So you hold your cup out to God. Please, Father, I'm thirsty. He doesn't just give you a little tap water. He turns on Niagara Falls and gives it to you. Here you go. As much as you want. It's all yours. And he does that for every single one of his children. Every person that comes to him faith in Jesus is given the lavishness of his love, his grace, all of his blessings. Niagara Falls, for you. You can jump in anytime. You ever been to Niagara Falls? That's a lot of water, folks. One fifth of the world's freshwater supply goes over Niagara Falls every day. Now, Niagara Falls is not infinite, but God's love for you is. So if Niagara Falls is one human example of lavishness, you'd have to multiply that by 10 trillion times 10 trillion to even come close to how lavish God's love is for you. A little bigger than we can imagine. That's what God has predestined for every person who comes to him through Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 7, he lavishes upon us redemption through Jesus' blood, which means you have been completely redeemed from every bad thing you've ever done. He has paid the price completely for you, lavishly. In verse 7 again, he has given you forgiveness. He's lavished forgiveness on you for all your trespasses, all your sins. Remember earlier in this passage, it said we're holy and blameless. So you can stand before the Supreme Court and go, you can't touch me, I'm clean. Right? There's not one warrant out for your arrest. You've done nothing wrong ever. 
How cool is that? Not one lie. All you fishermen that caught a fish this big. Right? We've never done anything wrong because of what God has done for us in Christ. He's forgiven our trespasses. He's lavished on us in verse 9 the mystery of his will. He's actually revealed holy, godly secrets to all his children. He's revealed things to you that people for thousands of years have wondered about. And he's made them known to us. In verse 10, he has lavishly revealed his administration. You know what that means. All of his rule and reign, Jesus inaugurated before he was crucified. When he began preaching, he said, I'm establishing the kingdom of God here and now, folks. Repent and believe. He's revealing it through the church today, and he's going to reveal it in greater detail, in greater physical reality, when Jesus actually steps upon the Mount of Olives someday soon, and it splits. It's going to split the eastern gate of Jerusalem. Jesus is going to walk in and say, the Messiah's here, folks. My way now. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jesus is going to establish his administration and he's already revealed it to us. And in the church, he's already our boss. He's already our God. He's already our Savior. Amen? Amen. So we live under his rule joyfully now. And we're looking forward to him coming and establishing his kingdom. Amen. So he's revealed this to us with all his predetermined plan in all his grace. He's already told us. And we already talked about Bill Gates' inheritance. In verse 11, we've already lavishly obtained a heavenly inheritance. So all of God's riches, all of his love, all of his blessings, all of the grace of God, he's given to us. It's ours today. It'll be ours tomorrow. It'll be ours a thousand years from now. How cool is this? You can't exhaust God's inheritance for you. Amen. Verse 12. His amazing predestined will for us will result in our new life bringing praise to his glory. Often in our own sinful, prideful selves, we, we work and we scheme and we, we manipulate things so that people will notice us and give us praise. But as we grow in Christ and in his predestined will, we're going to grow in our ability to bring him praise. People will focus less and less on us and more and more on him. That's a good thing. And that's what God's will is working out in us. Our new life will bring praise to Jesus. Verse 13, he lavishly, after we believe in Jesus, does something you and I can't see, but it changes everything. He seals us in his spirit. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. Ho hum. I'm ready for my nap now. When a king in Jesus' day, Herod, for instance, wanted to make a new law, he would have his scribes write it, and then he would pour some hot wax at the bottom of it, and he would take his signet ring that had his seal in it, and he'd smash it into that hot wax to put his symbol into that document, and then it would become an official law. He'd seal it with his own seal. So what has God done, the king of the universe? He has put his seal in you. He sealed you. That's kind of cool, huh? No matter how earlier I talked about the analogy of God transferring us out of the DNA of Adam and into the DNA of Jesus? Well, he's made that permanent. He's sealed you. So this is actually legal language Paul is using. And so if you wanted to adopt a baby, you'd have to go to a judge and he'd have to sign the documents in the courtroom to make it legal. God does the same thing when he seals you in his spirit. Then our problem is not that we disbelieve the word of God. Our problem is we don't see it. I want to tell you something really cool. God sees it, and the angels of heaven see it. 
And God's told us this. In Daniel and in Revelation, God is going to send angels to pour out his wrath on sinners just before Jesus coming back to establish his kingdom. And the angels are going to be looking at every single person and they're going to see, oh, sealed in Jesus, not sealed in Jesus, right? And every person that's not sealed in Jesus gets the wrath of God. Every person that is sealed in Jesus is not touched by God's anger. God sees his seal on every believer in Jesus. And we're like, oh, I wish I could see that. But you know, here's our problem, honestly. If we could see it, you know, it would be like, nee, 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 I got the seal and you don't. And, you know, we'd be like little kids rubbing it in everybody else's face. And, and you know, that'd just be obnoxious. Isn't that the truth? We'd be acting like we're better than we are instead of being humbly and de humble and dependent on Jesus Christ. And God says, no, nah, I can see it. That's good enough. The angels can see it. You're fine. And here's the best part of being sealed in the Holy Spirit by God. God has this inheritance for us, and he's given us a pledge. You know what a pledge is? It's not that stuff you clean your furniture with. It's not. A pledge is something you sign legally when you are incurring a debt or making a contract and if you're going to buy a house and not pay cash then you have to sign all these documents where you're telling the financial company they legally own the property until you pay it off so you're pledging the house and the property to the bank until you make the last payment we don't have a problem with that it's our house right well when you make the last payment Jesus made the last payment when he died on the cross. God's pledged our inheritance by himself. God didn't put up property. He didn't put up a house. He actually gives every single believer in Jesus Christ his Holy Spirit. God himself is given to every believer in Jesus. So God not only sees his seal on you, the Holy Spirit is in you. And if you read John 17... Jesus literally prays that not only will he abide in us as we abide in him, but God the Father will abide in us and the Spirit will abide in us. So your body is literally the temple of the holy God himself. God lives in you. This is part of God's predestined plan. He's pledged your inheritance. All that he has planned for you, he's pledged and sealed by the Holy Spirit. How cool is our God? Could you come up with a better plan? So when you live this week, whose plan are you going to live by, yours or his? I think I want to try and live by God's plan this week. Amen? Amen. Before I pray and, and release us out of here to go get our naps, <laughs> honestly, we need to thank God for all he's done. Amen? We need to rejoice in the goodness of his predestined plan for us. Easter's coming, and we want to remember what Jesus did for us. Because when he died on the cross, it was a predestined plan of God. And when he rose from the dead, he conquered everything, accomplished everything, and gave us an open door for a relationship with him that is eternal and here and now. This is God's predestined plan. This is how good his love is for us. When we live in this love, we live it in, in a practical way in a relationship with him and in a relationship with others. So when you open your bulletin, you look at the, the different announcements that are there. These are ways we engage with our brothers and sisters in Christ, this predestined plan of God. And there's three things in this that focus on children. So I invite you to look in your bulletin right now. And there's three things I want to highlight. We have a children's ministry Easter basket outreach. We're going to bless the orphans in the Sacramento Children's Home. There's a whole bunch of empty baskets right back there by the sound booth. So before you leave, you can take one of those baskets if you want to and make an Easter basket for an orphan. And the details right there in your bulletin. And then we also have uh, an Easter candy donation. So we're also inviting people if they'd like to, to you know, buy some Easter eggs and, and fill them full of candy. And we're going to use these to bless the kids on Easter Sunday here. And so you can read about that in the program. And then on May 17th, we have a children's ministry training workshop that's going to be here in Sacramento 
put on by group publication. And group is one of the, the biggest uh, publishers of Christian uh, curriculum for children in the world. They're great. They're putting on a workshop for training children's workers, children's volunteers here in Sacramento. So if you'd like to come to that, if you'd like to serve our community, not just our church, but our community to help all of us more effectively reach children for Jesus, then you can come to this workshop. And if you will guarantee in Christ that you'll go to this workshop, the church will pay for it, okay? So just letting you know that. Now, I have an announcement that's not in the program. We have other things going on. We have our service at Union Gospel Mission tomorrow night, Monday night, so you can be a part of that. And then we have our women's clothing exchange coming up March, 20, March 22nd. There's an announcement in the back, and you can sign up back there to be a part of the women's clothing exchange. And all the leftover clothes are going to go to St. John's Women's Shelter. That's an awesome thing. And today is the last day. Which day is it? The last day. Thank you. The last day to sign up for the women's retreat that's coming up. So if you haven't signed up yet, you've been thinking about it, please talk to Sharon Wickham. Sharon, raise your hand. That's Sharon. Talk to Sharon. She will help you get registered for the women's retreat. Amen? Amen. So I invite you now to stand. May God, may God, may Jesus, may the Holy Spirit bless each one of us as we leave this place that we would walk in the joy of his predestined plan for each one of us. For the glory and praise of Jesus. Amen.